Let's take a quick look at MON's stats. So right off the bat, MON has very good stats for an NPC. Uh, she's got a max dexterity as a thief. And that's actually, you know, you'd think that there would be a lot of characters in this game who can accompany you on your quest that have a maxed out stat in their in most important stat. This is not the case. This is not the case at all. Even some of the better characters don't actually have the max stat where it counts. Imowen also has a 16 constitution. If you remember, for, or were there, from when I was talking about the breakpoints and stats, that means that she's going to get the maximum number of hit points per level. As a thief, she does not need the 18. And she also has a 16 charisma, which makes her a good party leader. If you yourself dumped charisma. <clears throat> I wonder who would do that. <clears throat> um... But here's something interesting. She is a 17 intelligence. I wonder what we could use that for. Well, we can't do it yet. But one of the classic things to do with Imowen is about the time she hits either 5th or 6th level, depending on your taste, you can dual class her into a wizard, into a mage. Now, dual classing is something that only the human characters can do. And oftentimes, I will make human characters as my main protagonist because of how powerful dual classing can become. You can only dual class once, so you can only get two classes as opposed to multi-classing, which gives you three. But if you remember from what I said when it came to multi-classing, I personally think having three classes splits your pool a little bit too much. But the great thing about dual classing is, as opposed to multi-classing, where you have to level up both classes at the same time, thus splitting all your XP, you can take your character, get some type of key attribute that you want from that character. In the case of Imowen, what we want her to have is we want her to have maxed out fine traps. We want her to be able to, we, we're going to dump as many points into fine traps as we can, and then we're going to put the remainder of points in open locks, and then we're going to convert her over to mage. And from that point on, rather than leveling up thief and mage together, she just levels up as a mage and therefore can get to a far higher level as a mage than if she had leveled up Thief at the same time. Only now she gets to have, you know, fine traps and open locks. As well as backstab. There is only one drawback to dual class. When you dual class, you start your new class at first level. You get to keep some of your hit points but all of your stats, as far as Thacko and saving throws, are all going to be your first level stats. Then, you also lose, temporarily, all of your abilities from whatever class you dual classed out of. So when I initially dual class her from Thief, She's going to lose all of her thief abilities. This is annoying, but it's worth it. Once she exceeds her level that she achieved, and for me, I'm probably going to take her up to 5th or 6th, as I said. So in other words, once she becomes a 7th level mage, she gets those thief abilities back, and then she gets to keep whatever the best stat is from each of her classes. Of course, as she levels up, the wizard will eventually just outclass the thief. So we have a question. 
Does XP to level adjust back to level one? Yes, it does. She levels up just like she was a level one character. So she's only going to need, I believe it's 2,500 experience points to get to level two wizard, etc. and so forth. I personally believe that in many cases, dual classing can be powerful. However, with the enhanced edition, they made some changes to the way multi-classing works. Back in vanilla Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2, dual classing was almost entirely the more powerful option of the two versions of running two classes. In enhanced edition, however, they've changed the way that epic feats work. As opposed to being keyed off of level, they're now keyed off of experience points. And that's your total experience points, not the experience points in each class. So you get access to your epic level abilities a lot sooner than you would have in the original Baldur's Gate 2. Now, of course, we don't have to worry about that until Baldur's Gate 2. But that is why I chose a multi-class character instead of a dual class character. So this way... I get both Time Stop and Whirlwind, which is always fun. So that's Immowind for us. She's probably going to stay in the party because she is one of the better thieves and then eventually a pretty decent mage. Not a we've got some more party members we've got to pick up, though. Hello there. Oh, hi. How are you doing? And we meet a Gibberling. Let's kill the Gibberling. This should not take very long. See? Oh, it was a diseased Gibberling. It wasn't even a true Gibberling. Diseased Gibberling. So we were, we were get doing it a favor. You know, putting it out of its misery. Yes. So, I mentioned earlier in the stream the benefits of having playing evil versus the benefits of being good and how I thought that as a general rule being good is the better way to go you get better quest rewards you have access to more quests just on the whole like even if you're playing neutral or even evil you want to be as heroic we shall say as possible One of the other drawbacks to playing an evil character, at least in my opinion, is that for some reason, Bioware decided to interpret all evil characters as either surly or prickish. And this is no exception. So now we have Zar and Monteron. They are evil! They are very, very evil. Zar is... Well, Monteron is a multi-class fighter thief. And he's pretty good at what he does. Uh, he, he, he does come in tow with Zar, our chaotic evil necromancer. Who is definitely not the best wizard that you can get. Which is to say, he is not Edwin. Hey guys, it's Divine Erdrich. If you like what you saw, go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe for more content coming soon. Uh, you can also follow me at twitch.tv slash or on Twitter at Divine Erdrich. Thanks again.